So today is the four year anniversary of the day that I almost died. And obviously it's on my mind a lot more this year, just because I have the data myself to reflect. And I spend so much time, any time that I have free time, just reflecting on everything going on in the world and things that have gone on in my life. And I've told this story so many times, but I want to tell it one more time just because it seems like it has a lot more applications now because of the way that things have changed. And at least due to everything that's happened this year, healthcare and the need to look after yourself is now at the forefront of so many people's thinking. And it's so important, no matter how old or young you are or where you come from or yeah. So what happened to me happened as a result of a chain reaction. And four years ago, I was still living with my parents and my first boyfriend was someone they did not approve of, would not approve of. There were a lot of reasons for that, that, you know, I'm not going to go into for everyone's privacy, but long story short, I had begun unofficially living with him by fall of the year in 2016, just on and off. Anytime I would have a falling out with my parents, I would go to his house. And at the time that was his parents' house and his room was just in a portion of the house. Um, they lived farther away out of the city um, in an agricultural town and it's a smaller city in my state. And I, in contrast, had always lived with my parents in a very large home in an affluent suburban neighborhood in the major city, yada, yada. It was really like the classic story, if you will. But I was um, on Medicaid at the time and I was getting care through a nurse practitioner who just routed me to different specialists accordingly. And at the time that I was seeing her, I was going to her for a series of existing chronic problems like immunodeficiency and a long-standing viral sequelae to um, hand, foot, mouth disease. And I could barely speak at the time. My throat had stayed really bad after having hand, foot, mouth. Um, if you see people walking, they're my neighbors, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> but long story short, I was getting Medicaid care, which as many know is subpar at best, even if you're doing your very best to negotiate it. So luckily I had a good nurse practitioner, but it's not all you will need if you have more debilitating or less understood problems. So in fall of that year, after having a long, depressing and stressful summer and, um, and a lot of things coming to an end and a lot of weird things beginning in my life, I was, um, my immune system was probably even more depleted and I got a urinary tract infection. And I bring this up just because women's care is still so poorly represented in America. Even if you have good insurance, it's women's reproductive care or anything related even to urinary problems. If you're a woman, you're just treated so poorly in so many instances, especially if you're young or especially if where you're getting sent to for care is like a women's clinic, which is exactly where I got sent to. And I say this because what they'll test for is the very most standard causes of infection like STIs or a pregnancy. And for me, neither of those were the case. So that's all they tested me for. They put me on a broad spectrum antibiotic and kept me on a couple of those for months, but my symptoms still continued. And in November, I think that my physical pain got put in, put on the back burner because I was having even worse problems with my family. The, the tension between me and them was getting worse. They were very angry that I wanted to spend Thanksgiving with my boyfriend's family. So they were telling me not to come home and things like that. They may have not mended at the time, but I thought they meant it. So I was with my boyfriend's family and I was getting sicker. My health was on the decline, but I was going to the doctor less frequently because of the surge of people that come in during fall and winter. And I just thought whatever's going on is going to somehow right itself. Or if I just stay on one of these antibiotics, I'll be okay. But by December, I was getting really depleted. I was very tired all the time. And in the first week of December, I believe, uh, I heard on the weather channel that there was a snowstorm coming and I had gone back to my parents' house for a bit to try to make things right with them after Thanksgiving, but they were still so mad at me. And my boyfriend was uh, Skyping me one day before the snow set in saying that if I wanted to be with him when the snow starts falling and I have zero options for transit or leaving my place, you know, the time is now to get picked up and go to his place. So all of this time, I thought when the snow sets in, I better just be home because I feel so sick. But I was so miserable at home and both feeling sick and also feeling depressed that I decided I would rather be with him. So on a whim, I said, please pick me up 
as soon as you can. And I just got a small bag of essentials together. I brought my laptop and some extra warm clothes and whatever medicines I was currently taking, I think. And he picked me up against my parents' will. And we went to his place for the snow. And for context, my parents live up in the hills. So when it snows there, there's no chance of getting down the drive. So in retrospect, this was a good decision to leave just for what happened next. But the valley floor is where his family's home was out in I wouldn't call it completely the country, but very close to because civilization is a ways away on several dangerous stretches of highway. So choosing a place to be when the snow starts falling means you're staying there pretty much unless it's a non-essential trip. And even then, if it's an essential trip, you may get too snowed in to do it right away. Uh, none of their cars were like, you know, snow tires or four wheel drive. So we go there, the snow starts falling and I'm just feeling really not good. I go to one last doctor's appointment in the city on the first day of the snow the following day. And it, the roads were not impassable at that point. I thought this, this trip better seal the deal for whatever I need so that I can just go back to his place and crash, take my medicine and get well while being with him. So I go for one last appointment at this women's clinic and they have a bunch of tests pending, like urinalysis and swabs and things. So I go and I take my broad spectrum. It's not even a broad spectrum. It's a limited spectrum, actually. It's a it's called Macrobid. It's an antibiotic for a general urinary tract infection. And I go back to his place. And so many of these aspects are a blur. So even as I tell the story, as much as I've thought about it or relived it in my head or in my dreams, it's still blurry. So... Basically, what I remember happening was I could barely stay awake in the car on the ride. And he was doing a lot of things for me. So it wasn't hitting me how lethargic I was until something would come up, like I need to get out of the car or we need to do something together on the way home. And I felt very heavy and very shivery. We get back and this was when he worked a night shift. So we were lying in bed together, probably in the middle of the day towards early evening. And he was trying to rest up a little bit before he had to go to work since he had spent part of his day that would have been asleep taking me to my last doctor appointment. So we're lying together and he feels my forehead and says, I feel warm. And I didn't process it. I said, what do you mean? And he said, I think you have a fever. And I had seldom ever had a fever and certainly wasn't. Uh, prone to them. And I thought that was weird, but I didn't really think a lot of it because all I wanted to do was sleep. In all the time leading up to this, increasingly I was sleeping and increasingly I was just trying to ignore the pain that I was in. And actually I'd gotten quite stoic with pain due to the chronic pain that I'd been living with with my throat. So new pain, like from the urinary tract infection and everything that didn't feel right in my lady area was kind of something I was just dealing with. So I go to sleep, I wake up, he's getting ready for work, and my fever's gone a lot higher. I didn't know this yet, though, because I went into his family's kitchen, and his mom, I guess, had been thinking about me and made some chicken soup in a crock pot, and she served me, and I was sitting there trying to eat it, and I was shaking like a leaf, and my boyfriend asked me a question, and my ears were kind of ringing by then, and I didn't process his words, so... Whatever he said, I sort of morphed it in my head into something else. And I thought he said, I love you. And I just said, oh, I love you too. Kind of, you know, silly. And his mom and he looked at each other and said, are you okay? Because they had already at this point seen me for the most part not okay. I was chronically sick. So it was, it, it must have looked bad uh, and been significantly worse than what they were used to for them to say something's really not okay this time. So they asked me to go into the bathroom and take my temperature again. And in the time from when I fell asleep with a mild fever to now when I was awake, probably towards 7 or 8 p.m., my fever had now gone up to 102.5. And for me, I'm not sure I'd ever had a fever that high in my life. Maybe once when I was four coming down with a severe flu, but certainly never as an adult. And since I'm given to a subnormal temperature like 97 or even 96, that's quite a fever for me. And it genuinely felt hard to breathe just getting out of my chair in the kitchen and walking to the bathroom to take my temperature. And I felt my pulse and it was going so fast. By then I had been dealing with health problems for so long that I kind of knew how to self-diagnose and like triage myself because they're so used to it and they don't know what to think anymore when you say there's a problem because there's always a problem. So anyway, 
I come out of the bathroom. I know something's really wrong. Um, my boyfriend's mom, and I think even my boyfriend simply assumed that maybe I was coming down with the flu. So they were asking the grandma, my boyfriend's mom's mom, uh, for tips on how to get a fever down. And we were just applying the most general tips possible, assuming that the fever is viral. Um, so it's you know, ice on the back of my neck, and popsicles and Tylenol, maybe vitamin C tabs, stripping down the blankets that I'm wanting to cover myself in. And my boyfriend still needed to get to his shift by 10 p.m., but he was apprehensive to leave because I was really in bad shape. But I was telling him everything's fine because I think most people, when they get a fever, assume that it's going to break and that nothing bad's going to happen to them. And especially just the fact that I really just wanted to sleep and could barely stay conscious. I was just saying everything's fine. I just need to sleep more. But uh, a lot of red flags should have been going up at that point because I'd never had trouble breathing before or just a feeling of being heavy and like walking through quicksand. It just felt felt terrible. And I had a vicious, vicious, vicious headache. So anyway, his mom agrees to check on me during the night uh, to make sure I was doing okay. And my boyfriend sets me up with, you know, TV remotes and distractions. And they, they make sure that there's extra food for me and whatever I might need in the night. Um, and after he leaves, I wanted to um, just sleep. But the problem with just going to sleep was that I was sort of waiting for my fever to break because I had taken Tylenol and I had taken all these measures to try to get the fever down, but it still wouldn't break. So his mom was feeling a little bit nervous about that. So using the laptop that I had brought, I logged on and was looking up my symptoms because it's actually uncommon to have a fever that high with just a urinary tract infection. And obviously the first thing I find is a kidney infection. And I hadn't been paying attention to things like the color of my urine or anything important like that. So when I started peeing in a clear glass, I noticed just how brown it was. And I thought, well, this is very not good. So I call an on-call nurse who is the only person I can reach from the women's clinic that I had just gotten seen at. And I ask her for advice saying, I'm very concerned I'm developing a kidney infection. She says that it's most likely the UTI and I just have to give my antibiotic a chance to work. And also sometimes antibiotics alone can cause an antibiotic fever. So I want to believe her. That would be a nice soothing explanation if I could believe her, especially because the snow has been falling all day and we're getting quite snowed in, but it's not that simple. I trust my gut and I think I'm getting a kidney infection if I don't have one already because there's a lot of like discomfort in my upper back. It was hard to dis describe, but again, all of the pain that I was in was kind of like it was through this malaise of exhaustion and my head hurting. So. I couldn't say that I was in a bunch of discomfort. It was just this feeling of absolute lethargy. So anyway, I I call my parents and we had not been on very good terms at that point, but obviously they're still my parents and they're very nervous. They, they want me to uh, call an ambulance. And obviously I, at the time, I my biggest problems with doing that were ambulance insurance, you know, perks of being an American, the cost of riding in an ambulance, and then also... I think I didn't even know at that point that maybe Medicaid would have covered ambulance insurance. But even if I had known that, I think I would have thought that that's a complete overreaction and that my boyfriend's family is going to look at me like I'm crazy and hypochondriacal. And um, I thought that's also a waste of 911's time and resources to try to get them out here to me in the snow and drive me where. It just sounded crazy to me. I thought all I have to do is mollify whatever infection is going on until the snow breaks enough to get to either one of the hospitals or just back to the women's clinic or whatever. So the last thing I thought was that I couldn't make it through the night. I just thought perhaps I need to get myself on a stronger antibiotic. And back then I had some pharmacy knowledge. Now I'm a certified pharmacy technician, so I have even more. But back then I sort of thought I knew what I was doing. So I looked up what Google says about antibiotics that can cure a kidney infection. And I see that Cipro is right there at the top of the list. And it's so heavily prescribed in my area. I had a feeling that maybe my boyfriend's family had some Cipro on hand. So they were up watching some evening television and I just wander into the living room in my pajamas. And I said, I think I have a kidney infection. And everyone kind of turns around like, what? And, um, that it gets the mom's attention. I say, do you have any perhaps leftover antibiotics I could take until the weather's less terrible and that we can get back to my regular clinic? 
So she looks around and she actually finds an entire course of Cipro that is correctly dosed for the treatment of a kidney infection because it was prescribed to her a time ago, but she couldn't stay on it. So it's basically an entire course of Cipro still left in the bottle of pills. So I take the first one and feel very intelligent at this point. I go back to the bedroom and call my parents and I say, I'm, I'm taking some Cipro. It's going to be okay at least until the morning. They're not satisfied with that explanation, but I just keep telling them I'm okay because I wanted to believe I was okay, obviously. And I think also by then with the headache and the way I was feeling, logic wasn't working too well in my head. But um, throughout the course of the night, I got much sicker. The sleep that I thought would come to me so easily didn't because of how much tremendous pain my head was in. They had given me a spare thermometer to keep in the room. And by 2 a.m., when I was just trying to go go to sleep, my fever was 103, uh, slightly over 103. And I was doing everything I could to take off blankets. And it's frightening that my fever was even that high because it wasn't like I was in a cozy, warm room or under cozy blankets. This was a garage that I was staying in. And it's during the snow. The, the room probably at, at most was 60 degrees, but I'm going to guess it may have been in the 50s even. And... Being in a place so chilly with a lot of weird thoughts popping into my head when I was having all of these in and out of sleep fever dreams, I was already so depressed I didn't care partially about what happened to me. And by early morning, I was having what I can only describe as delirium because not only were my ears ringing and my head was killing me so much that I felt like I couldn't just sit up, I could hardly move. I, I was in immense pain, mostly in my head, and I couldn't wake myself up properly. I kept thinking... I just can't wake up because I'm so tired, but then I also couldn't sleep. So I was just basically stuck in a delirium, sort of looking at the room around me in and out of consciousness, and then picturing myself in the snow, picturing myself walking out into the snow and dying in the snow. Then parts of my brain suddenly weirdly giving me messages, uh, subconscious warnings that I was going to die. And then depressed parts of my brain saying, but maybe that would be okay. Maybe all you would need to do to steal the deal is walk out into the snow somewhere where people couldn't find you and lie back down. So a lot of just dark, horrific stuff happened to me. And it was like, if you've ever seen a, like a fever dream sequence in a movie or something, really depressing film, it was kind of like that. But I came out of it by early morning, probably around 6.30 or 7 a.m., I think. I, I only can imagine it was that because it was beginning to get light out and my boyfriend doesn't get home until 8, 15, 8, 30 in the morning. So at that point, I kind of, I'm going to guess maybe the fever broke slightly or something happened, but I feel extremely lucky because it kind of pulled me out of this daze that I had been in where I couldn't sit up and get conscious. And the first thing I do when I sit up is try to take my temperature. And by then it was about 104. And I'm not sure... I can even describe what having a fever like that felt like. It just felt like death. Um, it was the closest I ever felt to just resignation. Um, and I was trying to take a drink of water and my hand couldn't hold still. My teeth were chattering. I felt both phenomenally cold and phenomenally hot. It was very difficult to describe. I was covered in sweat. Um, I don't think I'd bathed since I don't know when. So I was just all sorts of gross. And my boyfriend came home early from work and I found it difficult to speak because this whole time I had pictured what I was going to say when he comes home and I barely could speak. I just kind of fell on him and grabbed onto his jacket and like squeezed the you know, sleeves of his jacket and the front. And I was just like, I need to go to the hospital. So he gets a bag of essentials together and he's trying to figure out how he's going to take me because the snow has fallen so much that he was glad to get home safely, even in the first place. And these stretches of highway that we would need to drive to get to the major hospital were pretty well impassable at that point. So our only option was to go to the very small hospital on the valley floor, which is so small you can pretty well count the rooms, and they're so ill-equipped. I'm not even sure what on-site technology they have. Certainly no surgery department, certainly very limited radiology, certainly very limited staff. And it's early morning in the middle of a snowstorm in the dead of winter. It was around, well, yeah, it was December 15th today, four years ago. So it was a very bad situation. They bundle me up and get me in the car. Um, I don't remember much about the drive or anything like that. I just remember being taken care of. They took me back immediately. I think in the time that we were waiting for the doctor to see me, I became very concerned that I couldn't stay conscious. So I had 
gotten a piece of paper out and I believe asked my boyfriend to write down what I dictate as far as an advanced directive, basically. It wasn't necessarily an advanced directive, like if I fell into a coma or whatever, but it was like what medications I'm allergic to and what I think is wrong with me and how this all started. Because the only thing I could think that would have been wrong with me is a kidney infection. So the doctor comes in and I say, I think I have a kidney infection. They're trying to get a new urinalysis, but they're learning the hard way that I'm unable to produce any urine. And when they run some standard blood work, they find that my white cell count is so depleted, it's almost non-existent. And with a severe infection, your white cell count can go one of two ways. Obviously, it can get extremely high or it can get completely depleted and you don't have any defensive cells left working for you. So that's where I was. So as soon as he sees that blood work without even knowing yet what's exactly going on, he orders four full grams of an antibiotic. And for context, the standard starting dose of the antibiotic he used, Rocephin, is an injection of roughly 250 milligrams. So four full grams is quite, quite a lot. And I only got the picture of everything that was going on slowly. No one was telling me how sick I was. I was delirious. My boyfriend was sitting in the corner. I was shaking so much. They had to cool me off. So... All I wanted was blankets, but they were refusing me blankets. They were, they were, they weren't icing me down, but I'm pretty sure they were bringing cool packs um, and placing them all over my body. My boyfriend, who has a bunch of caregiving training, and um, he was doing a lot of that for them, as well as supporting my arm because the IV drip of the antibiotic plus fluids was going so painfully slowly because my veins were just being bulky. So he had like repositioned my arm a bunch of times, and you know the nurse was saying she doesn't even practically need to be there. He's doing the job. So that was sweet. That was what I'd remembered at the time. I was obviously just focused on the sweetness of him doing that and just whatever. And of course, I wish my parents could have been there. They they knew where I was. They knew I had to go to the hospital, but they could not have been there. They were up in the hills. So we were separated. And I'm not sure I was processing that I could be dying by then. I think I thought, oh, I'm where I need to be. And now it's going to get handled because it's just a kidney infection. But I didn't know it was worse than that yet. So when I was there and they kept trying to get that urine sample, my boyfriend was helping me out of bed because I, I, by this point, I couldn't walk on my own. All of this progressed very quickly, this decline. And he was helping me to the bathroom and helping me sit down and When I was trying to go, there was just nothing happening. And when the metabolic panel came back, they realized my kidneys were hardly functioning. And so no one was expressing to me the severity of the situation. But what was happening was actually blood poisoning and organ shutdown. So the kidneys were not filtering out the urine. The urinary bladder wasn't pushing out the urine. It was a very, very bad situation. So sepsis, I can't say enough about sepsis because both in America and across Europe and, you know, the world over, it's, it's known as the silent killer because it can mimic so many other things and it moves so fast and so insidiously that you're not thinking that you're dying until you are. And once you go into septic shock, your chances of coming out of that and surviving and everything are 50-50 of that. And sadly, people have died of septic shock at home when their doctors told them that they just need to wait for their antibiotic to kick in. Or maybe they even went to the hospital and got told that they had a flu and a rash and to go home with some paracetamol or whatever. So thankfully, it wasn't that situation in my case, but it very well could have been because before the doctor made the snap decision to order the antibiotic based on that white cell count blood work before everything else was known. They were just giving me Tylenol and wondering why it wasn't helping. They were trying different fever reducing medicines and nothing was working at all. But they did make a few irresponsible decisions. One was to send me home midday because my boyfriend had been up since the prior night and we needed to go home. So I was trying to say, oh, well, that's all right. I, you know, I feel much better. I didn't, but I figured the fever's coming down just a little. So maybe it'll continue going down back at his place. But what happened instead was it started coming right back up as soon as the antibiotic drip had completed and the, the antipyretics had worn off. So we're there. And uh, I think that the doctor had ordered obviously a ton more follow-up antibiotic to take. And we were going to go pick that up, you know, maybe that evening thinking we'll just have a space in the day that's 
just where I'm waiting for that antibiotic, but we've just, you know, taken a garden hose and shoved a bunch of antibiotic in. So it'll be fine for a while, but it didn't go that way. I didn't make it till evening. What happened was apparently some ER notes, since all of these health systems are connected um, under Medicaid, the, the ER notes went to the women's clinic place. So an OBGYN looks at them and gives me a phone call in the middle of the day when we all thought things were settling down. My boyfriend had called out of work that night, figuring he's done with snow driving, he's done with work, he's done for, and now we're all just going to sleep. But the OBGYN gets on the phone with me and says, you need to go back to the major hospital. You need immediate radiology. You may even need surgery. And I ask why. And she says that some of my swabs and my urinalysis has come back and I have a very aggressive strain of bacteria, uh, both in the vagina and you know up in the cervix and just everywhere and up in the bladder. And I need a very targeted treatment. And she's also extremely concerned about the pelvic pain and thinks that there may be a chance of an ectopic pregnancy from before my boyfriend's vasectomy kicked in. So I was floored. And that's when I started getting very scared for my life because it was only during that phone call that I heard about the discharge notes from the first hospital and that blood poisoning was suspected in addition to a kidney infection. So this very insidious bacteria that had started as a minor infection had gone all the way and it needs not the antibiotics I was on. It needs a whole collaborative treatment. And then obviously, if there's an ectopic pregnancy in addition that needs to be removed surgically, if I'm also septic or on the verge of sepsis, the chances of surviving all of that go far down. So I tell boyfriend what's going on. And I don't, we were so shocked. And I'm crying and he's holding me and I don't want my parents to know. I thought I might die. I don't want them to know how I died. Didn't The whole thing just felt surreal. I thought I'm not going to see age 27. I'm, you know, I'm going to die at 26. That's what I thought was going to happen because the OBGYN made it seem like she was sh so sure that there was an ectopic pregnancy as well and that I need emergency surgery that I thought, there's no way I've never had surgery in my life. I, I somehow thought I'm not going to live through all that, all that together. So the snow's still been falling. The roads are not safe. The hospital is two cities away and I'm not sure how we're going to get to it. He's on absolutely no sleep. He's been up for two days straight at this point. And I tell him, if we're going to do this, why don't you just drive me there and drop me off? And he adamantly refuses. He packs another bag for himself. He packs a bag for me. I can't stop shaking and crying. We get in the car and drive on the snowy roads to the hospital. And I thought we could just die on the drive. That seemed like the perfect like icing on the cake. I just thought we're going to die on this drive because the roads were so dangerous and slick and icy. The snow still falling. It was just surreal. And I couldn't say a single word on the drive. I was just wrapped in jackets and blankets and just trying to stay awake and to think that, you know, we're all done with this and there's this whole letdown and then no, we're right back in the car. We're going to do it all over again. Now I might need surgery. It was completely overwhelming. And that's when I really was so sure I was going to die. That's all I can think of. And we get to the hospital again, total blur. I'm pretty sure they got me in a bed pretty fast. I had to be hospitalized until the, at least the middle of the night. They had to do a bunch of radiology. Luckily there was no ectopic pregnancy. So that was a false alarm but it didn't, it wasn't any less frightening. There was a ton of morphine. That was when like a lot of the immense pain set in because the entire area around my lower body was in just tremendous agony. It felt like needles were being shoved up inside me. Um, urinating was excruciating. Everything sucked. Morphine only made me stupid and dopey and enjoy Christmas lights a lot more, but I felt everything. But when all was said and done and they had done even more antibiotics and scheduled a whole bunch of follow-up treatment for me, um, my fever finally began to break. So when I arrived there, it was still in the 103 range and my blood pressure was not good. My vitals were not good. And when we were discharged, the fever had gone back to 99 and we knew we were over the dangerous place. Everything had finally kicked in. All the antibiotics had kicked in. And I felt obviously just dreamy then so much morphine and this being sent home, you know, sedated. I was in a wheelchair. My boyfriend wheeled me out and then carried me into the car seat. 
and then we were just he just put on some like soft music on the drive home. The drive home felt safe. I didn't feel like I was gonna die on the snowy drive home, even though that was probably the most dangerous leg of our trip, which was snow night driving. He held my hand in the car and I just leaned my head against the window and fell asleep. I remember being taken out of the car, carried in and put to bed, um, being awake and periodically to sit up, being, you know, fed and watered, you know, like drinks given to me, medicines given to me. And I think by the middle of the day, the following day, when I saw sun coming in, that's when I felt, you know, I'm not spiritual, but I felt kind of reborn because I woke up to the sun in, in bed and with the knowledge that the worst of it's over. And I wasn't well, well for a good five months after. There were a lot of follow-up appointments and the bacteria that kept causing this very insidious infection kept coming back. It was actually a, a colonization of group B strep, which I've subsequently found like practically whole women's support groups on just their horrific experiences of like malpractice related to the non-diagnosis of their group B strep pelvic infections that progressed to where they were hospitalized or even maybe made it to the ICU with similar things like blood poisoning as a result of antibiotics that don't tackle that strain of bacteria. And also just the fact that women's clinics and OBGYN's offices primarily do rapid screens for just the most common types of bacteria or infections like STIs or just they run their urinalysis as they do a you know standard antibiotic. But for group B strep, you need um, specific like targeted antibiotics that are not primarily the ones given. So anyway, when I woke up and I saw the sun and things were just different and I was just on my first course of what wound up being four whole courses of antibiotics. That's when I felt like just the tiniest bit of energy. That day I was able to walk again. The headache was not as bad. The severity of the headache was really the only thing that pulled me out of the worst of it, like out of, what's the word, succumbing? Wanting to succumb to it? Yeah, something like that. The headache was so severe. Anytime that subsequently I've been extremely upset to the point of someone asking me, would you ever want to harm yourself? I'm like, no, because if I ever get a headache like that again, I don't want to die that way. <laughs> when the snowstorm finally broke and it got safe to drive, <clears throat> it was actually a rather ironic story of how I made it home. The antibiotics had kicked in actually successfully, but I began feeling more lethargic and it's because they gave me ex extremely low blood pressure. So I actually took an emergency ride to the hospital once more by cab with most of my stuff uh, by myself when my boyfriend finally went back to work. Then I was in the hospital. Then I was discharged from the hospital. Then a different cab took me back to my parents' house because I figured it's probably time that I stop scaring the living hell out of my boyfriend's family and my boyfriend. So I finally went home. My parents were very, very eager to see me and know that I wasn't in any more immediate danger. And, you know, they, they took over care. And a lot of the problems that we'd had prior seemed quite small. They'd been absolutely terrified they were going to lose me. And when the cab drove up, my dad came out in the snow using a cane for balance and helped me out of the car. I'm sure my mom profusely tipped the cab driver and <laughs> thanked him as if he had saved me. <laughs> um, then um, they, they were almost out of food. They'd been holed up trying to deal with the snow, and but they found some stuff to cook for me and took good care of me for a while. And for a while, they were more lenient towards their sentiments about my boyfriend because they knew the whole experience had brought us so much closer together. So they let him come over and bring me some gifts and hug me. And obviously in time, I ended up back at his place when I felt well enough. <laughs> but so I wish I could say at the end of it that I felt, you know, this tremendous lust for life and everything, but there've been days where I just reflect on it and wish I hadn't lived, or there've been days when I feel extraordinarily grateful to have come out of it and then come out of it wiser and taken better care of myself and been more persistent and encouraged. The best thing to come out of it was to encourage friends and even strangers to be extremely persistent when they feel that something's wrong with them, because I don't understand why it at all, any doctor, or healthcare worker would act like people are faking it. Cause for the most part, no one wants to be there. It's expensive to be there. Even if you have insurance coverage that makes it free to be there, why would you want to be there for nothing? And it's 
there's just nowhere near enough focus on diagnostic medicine. It's always, well, it better be this most straightforward thing with the most straightforward treatment, or we don't know what to tell you. And this should have been a straightforward problem that never got this bad, but that's how it was. And that's how it is for a lot of people. And then this year with everyone suffering or knowing someone that has suffered, if not from COVID, but of, of things that are born out of the inability to access medical care, it's just a lot of similar situations where a small problem transforms into a life-threatening problem because people are just trying to handle it at home or something. So it's just the worst. But today I was reflecting on it way more than in prior years, just because sepsis is something I wish I could take an activism platform to talk about because it hurts me so much whenever I see stories from anywhere in the world of people that could have lived but died of sepsis because it's so easy to die of sepsis. I should know off the top of my head since I've graduated subsequently from pharmacy school, you know, what the letters of sepsis stand for as far as symptoms to look out for that are red flags. But I just know one of them is like feeling that you're going to die if you ever actually randomly feel like you're going to die, you might. So don't try to dismiss that feeling because it, it very much felt like I was going to die and the feeling kind of came out of nowhere. It was just like I woke up with it. I fell asleep just feeling tired and I woke up feeling like I was going to die. That's pretty much how it was. And I have no idea how close I was to septic shock. When I was in the first hospital, I had a skin rash around my arms and it took a while to go away. When it healed, it almost healed like a bruise. It started out red and then it turned a deep color before healing. And subsequently, when I've spoken with uh, who was my primary doctor at the time for follow-up care, she said that sounds like it very well may have been a sepsis rash. So that's very, very bad. And I'm, I couldn't feel any more empathy to the people who have died in the hospital or died at home being told they had a flu and a rash before I got sick again in the last year or so, I wanted to take all of the knowledge and all of the sentiments that I had towards the medical field and do something positive with it. So I studied pharmacy because all I could ever think of after that incident was the right person made the right call with the right medicines that saved my life. And I wanted to be part of the chain of command to help other people get the right treatment that they need. And while I've left it too late in life to be a doctor or a pharmacist, I made an achievable goal and I worked towards it to become a nationally hospital licensed technician. So hopefully at some point um, that'll be safe for me to put that skill set to use. But, you know, if not, I don't regret doing it because it was just something that I was passionate about. So, yes, I'm lucky to be alive. Very lucky, actually. And you're never too young for good insurance. That's important, especially if you're here in America. And this doesn't sound very original, but nothing is guaranteed to many people. I hear them talk about what they're going to do by the time they turn 30 or how many kids they're going to have or how many they want or what their partner's going to be like, what kind of house they want to live in, what career they want, this and that. And it's all well and good to think of that stuff. But in the end, it's a dream because I almost died well before the age of 30. And you just never know.